free agency is underway, where the Jazz look to the future, why new names may surface, and daunting numbers in day one and two. It's all next on Tip Off. Boom, 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 boom. Tiger Woods is still the best golfer in the world. Boom, boom, boom. boom. Might not be dominant, but who's actually as dominant at 30 plus that he was when he was young? Boom, 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 boom. boom. Wonder when we'll give him his due. Boom, 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 boom. boom. Haters are going to be so bummed. LeBron wins. Tiger wins. Bum, 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 bum. Who do they have left? Oh, we have a presidential election. We'll be fine. But um, bum, 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 bum. How's it going? Welcome to a Monday morning tip off. Hope you're well. Uh, lots of things to talk about. I'm going to try to just fly kind of without notes today because uh, there's so much stuff, which is probably a bad idea. So this could be certainly uh, going everywhere. All right, let's talk about free agency. It's underway. Uh, I wish the free agency would slow down a little bit because the I'm trying to get to the Kevin Murphy video and have that for you. I'm trying to do some Mo Williams analysis and have that for you. And... As of this moment, I'm getting neither of them done because of the insane amount of uh, free agency information that's coming through every day. And every time I sit down on a computer to do something, I end up doing free agency. So I will try to continue uh, to get those for you at some point. Um, by the way, Aaron Andrews to Fox. Just m- mentioned it. Aaron Andrews to Fox was the other big news this week, and I didn't mention it at the start. All right. From a Jazz perspective, when we look at the Jazz for free agency this year, it's all about next year's cap room. The Jazz have no players on their roster next year under salary. Now, they will pick up the uh, options on Favors, Hayward, Burks, and Cantor from all indications, unless something crazy happens this year. And then the Jazz have $16 million, but that still leaves them with $40-plus million of cap space. Now, it means two things to any player we're looking at for the year. It doesn't, the Jazz aren't completely, I won't touch any of that $40 million. Hey, if Paul Millsap and the Jazz can get to the extension at the right amount of years and, you know, the right numbers and all those kind of things, then he's probably a piece of the core for the future, and they'd be more than willing to do that. Uh, if there's a free agent out there that needs a two-year deal, and it chips in a little bit, but it's the right guy, they'd probably be willing to do that. But the whole essence of how this organization is situated right now is that $40 million plus cap room for next year, and anyone that they look at has to either, if it's a long-term deal, has to be someone that fits as the future piece for the franchise at that position. A lot of, oh, should the Jazz try to poison pill Jeremy Lin in the deal because they have this money. In theory, the Jazz could do that, but you better have decided that Jeremy Lin is the future point guard for this organization under all circumstances. And I'm not sure, uh, as much as that phenomenon was great, that that's actually uh, what you actually want there. Uh, and so when the Jazz look at a player, some people, oh, we should try out Michael Beasley. Michael Beasley is a really big question mark, great talent, but he's always been a knucklehead. And it's going to take three or four years, and I'm not, you're not willing to put that kind of question mark into that cap space when that's as important as it is. It is why I think there's a real chance that we could see some old names circulating, and not because that it's just old names. I'm not a big fan of, well, old names recirculating makes everyone uh, feel good about who – we know we are because we like the guy. I, I just want the best player available that fits the needs and the circumstances in the cap room of the organization. And I think there's a real chance that those guys that we're talking about are possibly former Jazz players. When I look at the Jazz roster right now, in the immediate form, it's mo, you know the, the guard situation is overloaded. You have Mo Williams, you have Earl Watson, Jamal Tinsley. Uh, excuse me, of Devin Harris. I'm really looking at Mo Williams as a two, with Alec Burks as a two, Gordon Hayward as a three, Damari Carroll as a three, and what you're looking to add is another wing player. Uh, you can, you're going to be able to trade. You may trade one of your pieces, but you're really looking at another wing player uh, to fit in there. Your bigs are set with your four bigs, and if Jeremy Evans returns, that's your five, unless you make a deal. But I, I think that. You know, we'll see. Uh, Kevin's very active right now, and, and he has shown 
actually, uh, particularly since the retirement of Jerry Sloan, on incredibly high level of activity. Um, it, you know, I don't know if that's coincidental or not, but if you go look at the track record of the organization, since Jerry Sloan resigned, we have not missed a single opportunity to alter the franchise and to do something. I, I wonder, you know, are we a more active franchise uh, now without Jerry than we were before? Maybe coincidental, maybe just where our talent is, maybe where the game's going, or the reality of, um, you know, what we're doing. Uh, so here are two names that I would throw out there. One, I did a lot of writing on yesterday. If you follow my Twitter timelines, there is Andre Karolinko. You know, when you look at the small forwards right now, they are Martel Webster. They are Carlos Delfino. Um, there's somebody else who I can't think of, uh, which may summarize a little bit of kind of the type of play. Brandon Rush, maybe. Michael Pietras and Richard Lewis. You know, when I look at who the Jazz are looking at as free agents, I really I think at this point that that those players, uh, and and I don't have I'm not calling agents and and I, I hate the agents. I'm not playing the agent game this time. I'm not going to start telling oh there's six teams. You understand what's going on there, right? The agents are creating value for their client. That's their job, and they're using the media to do it. I, I don't have a feeling I want to be a part of that. That's what the reporters are supposed to do. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying I don't want to do it. All right, so the the small forwards that are out there that I think are somewhat realistic are Carlos Delfino, Mikel Pietras, Richard Lewis, Brandon Rush, Martel Webster, Andre Karolinko, and possibly Kyle Korver. Korver, uh, depending on what the Bulls do with, uh, on this Umir Asik deal, uh, if, in fact, they... Um, they sign, uh, ask, they, they match that deal and just figure they'll deal with it. In all likelihood, they would then uh, let Kyle Korver go and not pick up his guarantee. When I look at those guys, first of all, uh, Rush is going to want multiple years on any deal. He's restricted that the Warriors are going to match it. So I, I drop him off the list. I don't think we can get him done. Uh, and we're only at the mid-level, and the Warriors are going to probably match that. So you take Rush off. Now, the next guy's... The key is which one of them doesn't get a marketplace or which is willing to come for a year on a one-year deal uh, or maybe a one-year with some options for the second year. Again, talking about our $40 million cap room. Uh, I think that's a Pietras, but at the minute we're at a one-year deal, he's going to stay in Boston. Delfino probably can get a, more than a one-year deal. Um, Richard Lewis would be interesting if, of what he's willing to do to try to revitalize his career and get going, but again, you know, is he, why is he coming to us when he might be able to go somewhere else? I, I still like his game and think he might be worth. Uh, Martel Webster's interesting. He certainly was a player that was on the verge of, of really clicking in and then went the other way. But when it gets down to it, if suddenly the Jazz have cannot sign and trade Andre Karolinko under the new rules from everything I've, despite what I've been told by some people that, and, and I wrote it wrong because I was told that, then uh, through some help of just all you guys, uh, and then, reading some other things, it seems that you cannot sign and trade Karolinko. But because you can't sign and trade Karolinko, the only places he can go where he ends up being able to go make more than the mid-level exception are the Utah Jazz or New Jersey, who does not seem to be in on Karolinko right now with all the other things, Joe Johnson and... Uh, all the other things they're doing with Derrick, Joe Johnson, and they just signed Gerald Wallace, and all of those things, I, I don't see that. Or Sacramento. And part of you has got to ask yourself, why would he want to go to Sacramento uh, unless there's another team with cap money? I, I think Andre's market at 31 years old and oft injured, as good a player as he is, uh, may be very limited. And now all of a sudden, uh, if you're the Utah Jazz, uh, do you offer Karolinko a one- or two-year contract, uh, maybe a second year on the contract based upon uh, if amount of games played or production? He knows the system. He's one of the few players in the league that makes you better defensively. And, you know, quite simply, if you just look at the Jazz and say, okay, we replaced if, – if you look at Mo Williams as a, as a one-two combo – and I don't know what we end up doing with Earl Watson and Jamal Tinsley since they're on the roster, but for this purpose, you say, okay, we're replacing Mo, Earl Watson and Jamal Tinsley with Mo Williams, and we're replacing really Raja Bell with Mo Williams. 
Now we're going to replace C.J. Miles and Josh Howard with Andre Karolinko. And we're going to allow our four young kids to continue to develop and improve. Those three areas improvement, the Jazz are a vastly better basketball team than they were a year ago. Now, what gets interesting here on the Jazz is their money situation. Uh, and that's this year, the Jazz at the current state with everyone on the books are at 60. Uh, 1 million guaranteed. Evans would make it, I think, about 63 million overall. The luxury tax is probably around 68 to, to 70 million. So you have to be a little careful. You can't start giving a lot of money to Karolinko or somebody, or else you're actually starting to touch toward the luxury tax. We don't need to be that, frankly. We don't even need to be that close to it uh, with where the franchise is. So that's how it's playing. That's where we get to Corver. If you don't get Karolinko done, and Corver suddenly becomes available. He kind of fits, too, as a backup small forward player that we're looking for uh, and, and how it's going to play, and his money probably shouldn't be astronomical. Um, and we could fit him at part of the mid-level exception. He knows the situation. We know him. But, again, not just that we know him. He's probably the best player available there for the circumstance. So I think there's a real chance that we actually see Karolinko back in a Jazz uniform or we see Corver. The key, obviously, of it is being years and the future. Uh, there's talk about Paul Millsap and him wanting a, uh extension. It, at $10 million a year, you probably have to consider Paul Millsap in, a, in some sort of an extension. His type of player is seemingly going at that number. That might be a bit high, but it's not excessively high. Um, you know, depending on what you think he is, the concern, I think, on any, and this is not specifically to Paul, but on any player who's undersized, who's been playing bigger players their entire career, is where their body is. Uh, you know, Paul takes a bigger beating than everybody else on a given night because he's a little undersized, he's battling that much harder, and you have to wonder when his body is going to hold whether or not his body is going to hold together. And I think that's a concern a little bit on how many years uh, you venture to Paul. But if the, I, I am a personally uh, a big proponent of the idea of getting either uh, figuring out whether you believe Jefferson or Millsap is part of the core. Maybe the answer is no. Maybe the answer is yes. And if one of them is um, trying to get that deal done. Now, it's it's a little more complicated than I just said because – Millsap's awfully good, um, and you've, but you've got to try to figure out who he is, who's the comparable player to him in the NBA. Uh, I, I think he's a, a little bit better than a Brandon Bass, but I think he's somewhat similar to a Brandon Bass, uh, and, you have to, and who's a free agent. So let's see what happens uh, with him this year. I think he's better than uh, Big Baby Davis, but I think he's in that same kind of realm of player, and he's at 6.4, so the right number on Paul might not quite be all the way to 10. It might be right at about the number where Paul is if he's going to probably start for you at some point or at least be a third big. Um, you know, the number that Paul's at right now at about 7.2 is probably a lot more uh, realistic than 10 million, but then the question is what do you have to do to get a deal done and all those kind of things. So, um, you know, when you look around the league at at what I would call – the second big or the third big, and Paul's right in there somewhere, right? He's um, he's not an elite power forward in the league, um, but he's proven that he's a good starter, uh, and those great teams have that third guy. Um, I think it's hard to try to figure – that's where you have to be looking at the salary comp, uh, though Paul has some larger value. I mean, the greatest deal in the league is Nick Collison at $3 million to play that um, third big position. That's just – one of the craziest, best contracts um, that exist out there. If you so, when you look around, that's um, and so, frankly, Tiago Splitter at 3.9 million is another one of those great deals. So you would be paying an awful lot for what if Cantor and Favors develop correctly and Paul's your third big uh, is an awful lot. Yes, there's a chance he's also playing some small forward minutes, but I um, and it's something the Jazz certainly need to do. Uh, but I, I wouldn't build on it too much. So th that's where the Jazz stands. There's a lot of news going on, um, but that's where the Jazz sit right now. Um, Channing Fry, by the way, is at six million. Paul should earn more than that. So Paul's somewhere in that eight kind of. And then it's interesting because if you commit to Paul, then 
I think you are allowed to then move Al, let Al play out the free agent year, and maybe Paul is more willing to come off the bench. That's kind of where I was going a minute ago. There's a psychology here where I think Paul's more willing to come off the bench if, in fact, uh, he's able to uh, know he has the contract and do what he needs to do, and that may help the team a little bit. All right, there's a lot of deals that have gone on, uh, and at 15 minutes into this podcast, or and, and uh whatever they call it, videocast. There's not a lot to be said. Quickly, let me just run through those and some of the latest rumors. The, the Nets have signed. Uh, I'm posting up. I'm trying to do this. Boy, I don't know if I can get this done. But every night, based on whatever new news is out there, I'm trying to post up a little blog that also posts what the impact on the Jazz is. That's at We Are Utah Jazz, day two, and it has the impact on the Jazz, so please read that. But Gerald Wallace to the Nets, four-year, $40 million deal. Wallace is actually very similar comp to Paul Millsap. I mean, that's kind of a very similar comp to to Paul, similar type player in a lot of ways. Um, and maybe I would actually say exactly the same uh, type of player. Uh, impact on the Jazz, I think it's taking away the market for Karolinko. It just shows you how desperate New Jersey is to sign Derek. The Rock, Darren, the Rockets uh, signed Omir Ashik to a three-year, $25 million deal. But the key on this is the third year of the deal is at $14 million, making it very difficult for Chicago to match. If Chicago does match, Kyle Korver is likely released on that deal. Um, and... Uh, then he becomes available. It also just shows you what the dollar value of seven footers is in this league. It's why you draft a guy like Ennis Cantor and hope you get him for a few years. Roy Hibbert, speaking of dollar values, uh, deal gets a max offer sheet starting at about $14 million a year. With the Blazers, uh, again, the impact is that Portland adds Roy Hibbert, who's a nice player. He's big. He's not great, though. I mean, that's I like Hibbert, but we're talking about a 13.9 rebound guy, two block shots, who shoots below 50%. I mean, he's very limited still offensively in, in what he does and who he is. Um, he impacts the game defensively, which, you know, I think we um, – we probably don't give enough credit to, uh, as I've talked about, there's never been a game without as many defensive possessions as offensive possessions. That's why Ashik got um, the deal he did. But, I mean, I, I, if you're signing Roy Hibbert to go with LaMarcus Aldridge, that's a pretty clogged middle. Uh, but I think that that's, it's, you know, clearly that's where you're heading. Uh, the only thing I would say on that that, I, that gets kind of very interesting for me here, uh, more so than than anything else is uh, Roy Hibbert actually had a – he got to the free throw line a lot more this year at 12% than he's ever done before. So he's actually heading in the right direction in regards to his uh, lock offensive rating. As I look at it, he's getting better. Aldridge is, um, is superior to him by a, by a large margin. It's, it, I think Indiana ends up matching that. Uh, just puts a bind on Indiana. And then, a question, then you have to look at Indiana's roster, and then that happens. I wonder, do they make another player available – to possibly the, the Jazz could scoop in on because of their salary situation. I mean, that's how you have to look at every single one of these things. Minnesota is going to offer Batum about a four-year, 44 or $50 million deal. I like Nicholas Batum, but I, I'm not sure that he fits into that that kind of crazy number on this thing either. Um, uh, but I, I like Nicholas Batum. He uh, had a very good year last year. He shoots the three well. He shoots about 34% of his possessions as a three at 40%. He gets the line just enough. He does a lot of different things. He's long, but that's a $11, $12 million player. Holy smokes are some of these numbers uh, crazy. My thought on this one is it's good for the Jazz because it just Minnesota and Portland battling for players. If he goes to Minnesota, Minnesota becomes a really uh, high-level team that probably becomes a playoff contender, but it also weakens Portland a little bit. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of things there that um, to keep an eye on. Uh, finally, Steve Nash sweepstakes is going on in the Darren Williams, Dwight Howard world exists as well. So other interesting slight notes for you before we wrap this up. Chris Paul declined a three-year $60 million contract extension uh, with the Lakers. Uh, excuse me, with the Clippers, which jumps out at me. Celtics are trying to keep the band together. Jamal Crawford is in serious conversation with the Clippers. He's also talked to the Suns, the Pacers, and the 76ers, but I think it's really the, the Clippers. Warriors are talking to J.J. Hickson, who I do not think much of. Um, <clears throat> but, you never, you know, that one gets interesting. If they're really that high after J.J. Hickson, then they should be more should possibly in Paul Millsap if you're going to move Millsap. Uh, though they already have David Lee, which is actually a really good comp to – to Paul Millsap, and he's earning like $14 million a year. I'm sure that's where his agent's going to go. Lakers are interested in Brandon Rush and Nick Young, looking for some bench scoring to clear. 
Um, I think that's, there's a lot of things going on, but I think that's about it and lines up the Jazz situation the best I can. Uh, I mentioned Tiger earlier. He's not dominant anymore, but as long as he's, when he starts winning these other events, he'll get a major eventually. He's back as the elite best golfer in the world right now. All right, that's 20 minutes. Let me get out of here. See ya. Go get, wake up the kids. They got bike camp and art camp today. The summer life of my children. Wow. See ya.